certainly want to thank and esteem for that song. Bless your name. I want to thank you, Reverend Howard, for leading us in worship. Thank you, Omari, for reading the word. Thank all of you for just being here today. It's a wonderful occasion. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. Place that over your door, on your refrigerator over your mirror in your car. And whatever you do, acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ over your life. And God promises that he'll bless you. But we're in the company of a man today who has trusted the Lord. He's gone through some things in life. I heard his testimony up at Word of Life about a month ago. <laughs> bless my heart, amen, as he preached the Word of God. Dr. Charles Ware, who now serves as the president of the Crossroads Bible College in Indianapolis and now in Fort Wayne. And he's talking about, I really want to have a ministry going in Gary, Indiana. And, and, and now he's looking at talking with my brother in Cleveland, Ohio. See, this is the day that Reverend Larry Payne, who retired this year from ministry, he said, this is the day for the African Americans to step up to the plate and preach Christianity. Not just blackness. Preach Christianity because our people need to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to hear it, really. And so. Dr. Ware, we're so glad that you have chosen to come to Fort Wayne. Uh, and uh, you kind of rebuked me because I opened my mouth a whole lot of times. And I talk about Southern Heights. And they think Southern Heights is one of these mega churches. All the great things that are going on in Southern Heights. And uh, I was at one of the meetings, and I remember the president, Dr. Charles Well, uh, uh, Well, I believe it was. James Wells, Dr. James Wells. He started a little school in Indianapolis, Indiana. Loved the word, loved the Lord. It grew now into what is known as Crossroads Bible College. And the unique thing about Crossroads 
is that it is a ethnic, it is a multi-ethnic ministry reaching blacks and whites on staff and in the school, and he's training young men to go out and to reach our urban community with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so happy to have him to come this morning to be our speaker. He'll speak to us this afternoon as we look at the banquet where we celebrate our 45th year in ministry here at Southern Heights Baptist. I'm not quitting, I'm not resigning. I'm not ready to fish. I'm ready to serve. Amen, Dr. Wayne. Amen. It is indeed a privilege to be here today. As a young man coming to Christ and going into ministry, uh, I was saved in a predominantly white church. In fact, I was the first black person to be um, uh, baptized. And my mother told me I looked like a fly in a bowl of milk. Uh, but they had the word of God. And then uh, I was saved in 1968. That's the year Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Robert Kennedy was assassinated. A lot of racial strife in our country. Uh, but God saved me and, and uh, began to guide me through his word towards the ministry. And I remembered as I made my way through Bible college and, and uh, was answering God's call upon my life, there was a few men in the country that uh, people began to speak to me about. And one of those men was Otha Aden. And so he became a role model for me and I still consider him a role model and uh, one of the people that God has used his example to, um, to stir me, to motivate me, to, to, to push me. And, and I feel I'm standing on his shoulders in so many ways. So we're delighted to be here. And, and, and um, <laughs> these last few weeks, we've been running a lot. The first weekend in July, we performed a wedding for our quadriplegic son. He broke his neck in 1996, uh, and, and God has given him a wife, and they've moved out of the house. And uh, I never thought I'd live to see the day when he would move out. I thought I would die before he moved. But God has provided for that, so we're excited about that. Amen. Then, then right after that, uh, Sharon and I, we took off, and, and uh, we helped them move into their new home. We drove to uh, Memphis, um, Tennessee, where our daughter bought a foreclosure house. It looked Horrible. I mean, it was a mess. Didn't even want to walk in it. It was dirty. It was filthy. But we walked in there and started working on that on a Saturday after driving. Then that Sunday, I jumped on an airplane and flew to uh, New York, Word of Life, where I spoke twice a day, and, and brother and sister Aiden was there. And then that Friday, I jumped on a plane and flew from, from New York to San Diego, preached for Dr. David Jeremiah Sunday night twice on, I mean, Saturday night twice on Sunday. Then flew back to Memphis, and we helped our daughter finish that house, moved her all the way into her house, drove back to Indianapolis, got in 2.30 Saturday morning. That Friday morning, I drove to um, Dayton, uh, uh, Ohio, and preached for a brother there. And then the following week, I found myself preaching in New York, in uh, Buffalo. And then the following week, you know, which was last week, no, the following week I was in Gary, Indiana. Then the following week I was here in Fort Wayne with Pastor Luther. Today, I am here with you, and I'm delighted to be here. And then after that, we're going to keep on rolling. We had, um, we're celebrating, our wife and I just celebrated 40, our 40th anniversary. And we are excited about that. In fact, I'm so excited. We got six kids. One of them's made off well enough. At J September 6th through 13th, he's paying us off. He's paying everything to send us to Yellowstone Park. I said, amen. Hey, hey, National. I said, man, that's great, man. Live long enough. Get some kids paying the bills. Amen. We praise God for that. But uh, yes, I am delighted to be the president of Crossroads Bible College where we're training Christian leaders to reach a multi-ethnic urban world for Christ. These are difficult, challenging times for Bible College, but there was a time when we need the word of God, it's now. And uh, we do thank God that he's opening some doors in, in Cleveland. Please pray for that because we have 10 pastors in one of our classes. We have about 20-something students there all together. We've just started there in January, and God is blessing that. And then there was a Bible Institute that just closed over in Chicago, and some of those students are looking to us now to help them finish their education. So uh, pray for us as we're there, but we're excited to be here in um, uh, Fort Wayne, and we're here partially because of the call of Otha 
upon me today. We need something here. We need the Bible College. Ever since Fort Wayne Bible College closed, he keeps telling me we need something here. So we're here by the grace of God. Amen. But you've been here for 45 years. 45 years is a long time. Amen. Uh, that's becoming something kind of antiquish, you know. A long-term marriages, long-term, long-term anything is becoming kind of out of date today. But it's something that God rejoices in, something that God promotes, something long time. I want to speak to you this morning on a subject that I have to speak to Otho on this one to get him in shape because every time I'm trying to talk to him, he gives me the, oh, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. I want to talk about the nothingness and the somethingness of the preacher. I don't know if somethingness is a root word or not, but we'll coin it for the day, okay? The nothingness and the somethingness of the man of God. He and Sister Sylvia served here for 45 years. And if you talk, oh, it's no big thing, it's all the glory of God, he's so good. Amen, that it is. But I want you to know that the Bible is filled with these tensions that we have to live with. We talk about the sovereignty of God. He controls everything. Not even a sparrow falls to the ground outside of God's knowledge and his control. But we also talk about human responsibility. That man has a responsibility. He's, he's, he, 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 he lacks power. He has inability. But he has responsibility before God. There's something about these tensions that we find in the word of God. And there's a tension because the author came up in a day. I know it. That's why I'm on his shoulder. He came, came up in a day when uh, there were a lot of black preachers who were taking advantage of their position and their authority. And they had all these things, the money, the cars, the clothes, the crowd. And many of them were living in immorality and ignorant of the word of God. Amen. Amen. But people thought they were something. In fact, they would say, I go to Reverend so-and-so's church. Amen. Well, I go to the church pastor by the right Reverend so-and-so. And, and when the pastor made a move, everybody followed. Amen. Because the pastor was somebody. They looked at him as somebody. And then came this group called a Fundamental Baptist, yes. Black Brethren. Yes. Some got saved. And, and, and actually, some of what they were taught was everything in the black church was wrong. And, and, and so they began to learn the word of God and, and began to teach the word. And, and these individuals forsook everything and said to people, I'm nothing. I'm just here to preach the word of God. And so we developed this culture where it's almost a shame to celebrate the man of God. Because we've seen it violated on one side, we react to the other side. Now, 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 now there, there's some, some scripture for that. I want you to, to, to take a look at this tension, but I want to give, give you this tension, and I want to walk you through this tension right quick, and, and then I want to just talk to you a little bit about a few things I want to talk to about the Bible, uh, about this particular day that you got. But turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, first of all. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, God... Paul is talking to this church that's caught up in worldliness of their day, the culture of their day. And part of the culture of their day was to make so much of men, so much of orators, so much of speakers that they lost sight of Jesus Christ. In fact, one of the things that demonstrated their carnality or their immaturity, as we would say, an individual, they're not living their Christian life. They, 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 they're, they're immature. And many of us, when we think of immaturity, what we think of is they're living in adultery. They're on drugs. They're drunk. Uh, they're doing this. They're doing that. All these, these horrible sins. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, and I, brethren, cannot speak to you as to spiritually mature people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. Now, now notice how he defines their carnality. Here's the definition. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Now notice verse 4, for, for when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? 
In other words, when your confidence is more in men than in the Messiah, that is a demonstration that you're carnal. And, and he brings this out here, and, 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 and he goes on, Paul is talking, he goes on to say in verse 4, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believe, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave an increase. So then, neither is he who plants is anything, that's that nothingness, nor he who waters but God who gives the increase. Yes, he is arguing with these people based upon a worldly philosophy that is taught at men over God. That Apollos is nobody, he's a great smooth preacher, but he's nothing. Uh, the great apostle Paul, I'm just out there trying to do God's work, but I'm nothing. It's God who gave the increase. Amen. He's something. He says in verse 7, So then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters with God to give increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now I want you to note the somethingness. In verse 9, For we are God's fellow workers. That's something. You're talking about being part of a company. I work for so-and-so. The CEO is so-and-so. The CEO of the church is God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And Paul says that, that he and Apollos were fellow workers. He says, you are God's field and you are God's building according to the grace of God, which was given to me. He is something because he's saved by the grace of God, called by the grace of God, indwelt by the spirit of God, equipped by the word of God and gifted by God according to the grace of God that was given to me as a wise master builder. This tension between the nothingness and the somethingness of the man of God. As mere human strength, he's nothing. But as a soul saved by the grace of God, indwelt by the Spirit of God, equipped by the Word of God, and called into the ministry of God to build God's people for the glory of God, to the advancement of the kingdom of God, he's somebody. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Just by the way, for those people who say, it doesn't really matter who's in the pulpit, as long as God's word there. Go back and read Miriam's situation of Moses and tell me that again. See, when God calls a person, when God places a person in ministry, when God equips a person, that's, that's God's design for that hour. And that's God's person. That was my introduction. Let's, let's get over to the sermon. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 13. And I want you to know that the man of God matters. He's more than a preacher. You and I need to always keep in mind that God plans, precedes his man. We can go all the way back to creation. None of us have been born that have preceded the thought and predetermined will of God. God planned always precedes his man, but God's plan includes his man. Therefore, the man of God is something in the plan of God, especially for the time and purposes for which God has brought him there. And then we also need to understand that God's plan transcends his man. God has never stopped his work because one of his sermons, one of his servants have passed on. That's right. The Bible is a revelation about God and his work in human beings and through human beings for his glory. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, a great book in the Bible where there's arguments about who wrote it, whether Paul wrote it or somebody else wrote it, but God wrote it, that's the important thing. 
But, 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 but in this book, this is a situation with some saints who've been saved and, 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 and they, were, they were tied up religiously in the Old Testament ceremonies and, and, and they were defecting back there and, and, and the writer of Hebrews was encouraging them that there's something better now. His name is Jesus Christ. That the Old Testament shadows in the Old Testament offerings and, 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 and ceremonies was just a shadow of the substance and Jesus is a substance. And, and he was he was he was he was he was sharing it them and showing them. Listen, listen. Jesus is better. He's better. He's better. He's better than anything that was there before. You need to come on up to the best. His name is Jesus. And as he gets towards the end of this book, he's given some exhortations and some encouragement. And, and, and in Hebrews chapter 13, starting with verse one, he says, "Let brotherly love continue." The, these moral exhortations now. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, as he's coming through these moral exhortations, he's going to talk about the challenge of, of, of drifting back to, to, to doctrines that are not that are not in align with what God is doing at that particular time. But there are two texts in this chapter 13 that I want to call your attention to that addresses this fact that the man of God is more than just a preacher. The first text is in verse 7. He says, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow considering the outcome of their conduct. Yes. Now those of you who've been upon this, for 45 years you've got a man of God supported by a woman of God. Yes. And regardless of what you think about how you understand the scriptures, the Bible is clear where it is exhorting these people. In fact, this particular text is probably talking about saints who are dead and gone on. But for those of us who say, well, God doesn't care about his man. Well, how, how come he talks about Adam and Eve? How come he talks about Noah? How come he talks about Jonah? How come he talked about Elijah and Isaiah, Jeremiah? How come he talks about Mary? How come he talks about Esther? How come he talks about Paul and Timothy? If men are not important, if, if God's not interested in people, why does he? The, God reveals himself through the people he saved and the way he works through their lives. And so this text tells us we're to remember those who have the rule over us. So this afternoon service is, is biblical in my opinion. And I want to talk about leadership role models. We live in a day and age where we are crying for role models. We're talking about the African American community and we're talking about the absence of fathers and absence of good role models. And I'm not so sure that there's an absence of role models but that we're looking for them in the wrong place. Amen. That's right. That's right. Now, how many of you would say that my pastor is a role model? You ought to be saying that because that's why God's called them. And the scripture says down here that, that, that there to be role models. And he said, says, remember, that is, that is call to mind, that is, that is don't forget those who rule over you. Yeah. Now, 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 the first thing he says here in, 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 in verse 7 of Hebrews 13 about these, 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 these leadership role models, God has designed, God has designed that pastors be a role model. Yes, yes. 
models in their rule over you. They have the responsibility of managing the house of the living God for the glory of God. That's what Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm writing to you that you might know how to conduct yourself in the house of the living God. Yes, What an awesome responsibility. Under the lordship of Jesus Christ, indwelt by the Spirit of God, the man of God stands and seeks to rule or manage, administrate the affairs of the church of the living God, the most important institution on planet Earth. You need to watch how he does it. I know Pastor Aiden, so I know he's, he's doing it right. As he said, nobody's perfect, and we're not saying he's perfect, but I, but I know enough of him, and I've had enough private conversations with him that I know where his heart is. His heart, his heart would mirror what 1 Peter chapter 5 has to say about the man of God, the elders, the leaders, managing the, 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 the people of God. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, it says, The elders who are among you, I exhort, I also am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers or rulers, not by compulsion, but willingly. In other words, not because somebody's making you do it and you hate to do it and you don't want to do it. You don't run around crying, it doesn't pay enough. There's too much, too much, too much anxiety, too much stress. People got too much problems, they're living in too much mess. No, 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 no. Shepherd, the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. You have a man of God that has been saved by the grace of God, that is thankful for the grace of God, that is motivated by the grace and love of God, and who serves eagerly, willingly. Now that's a rare jewel. In or out of the church. But he's modeling for you. He's modeling for you. God's model here, but, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. I've often told people what God requires in the pulpit, he expects in the pew. It is no mistake that if you read the qualifications of a pastor in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, 98, 95 to 98% is character. Character. None of this stuff, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, none, of these, none of these statements that uh, my private life has no bearing on my public service. None of this, I know what the people want. Yeah, I've been sleeping with 18 women, but I know what the people want. I can serve them. Character. A call of leadership is a call of character. For 45 years, a man has stood before you. He is not perfect. He doesn't say he's perfect. But for 45 years, he stood before you as an example in the way he administrates the church of the living God. He hasn't lorded over you. He hasn't tried to steal from you. He hasn't cheated. He hasn't lived in immorality before you. But he's led by the power of example. You need to remember that. You need to remember that. There'll be some smooth talking people with some good, rich sounding doctrine. Yeah, <laughs> they got the clothes, they got the cars, they got the reins. Yeah. Mm. 
Well, nothing wrong with that in and of itself, but you need to ask yourself, do they have the character? God's design for the pulpit, it is to, it is to, it is to, it's to be a model in the way they rule over you. And then models in their message to you. R remember the word that spoke to you. Now, 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 now here, here's the deal. What God wants in, in, in the pastor before the people is that he does not create his own message, but he communicates the Father's message. Pastor Aiden at 76 is about to get a doctorate. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Talking about Greek and Hebrew. Yeah. I want to teach about, yeah, I want, I want to, I want to, I, I want to, I, I want to teach a class for Crossroads for preachers. And his whole passion was, I want him to understand the Bible and how to, how to, how to teach the Bible. They've spoken unto you the word of God. In 1 Peter 4, 10, well, 4, 10 and 11, talk about every man's gift we receive from God. We'd be good stewards of that gift. Then it says, if any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. He's not the latest politician. He's not a psychologist. He, he, he is... A, he is a representative of Almighty God. He is the mouthpiece of God. Therefore, he has to study to show himself a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. Right. Now, let me tell you, that's precious. That's the word. People, I don't care about the word. I mean, my priest sharp. He can do this and do that. Listen, if you need your kidneys taken out, Would you go to a doctor who said, I've been thinking about this kidney thing. I just, I've been sitting down thinking, I got some new thoughts. I never operate on anybody, but I go and cut yours out. <laughs> no, thank you. Now, how come, how, how come we're concerned about people who work on our physical body, being educated, knowing what they're doing? And we're not concerned about those who operate on our spiritual body. Yeah. Amen. The word of God is, is compared as a scalpel. Yeah. Skilled surgeons use it yeah. to cut into you and cut out that which pollutes and defiles you. To bring healing and mending. The man of God is equipped by the, by the, by the spirit of God to equip the people of God to do the work of God. This yeah. is serious stuff. This is stuff that keeps individuals sane, keep marriages together, hold families together, impact communities. They've spoken unto you the word of God. And, and, what, 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 and what's so beautiful about it. And, and by the way, listen folks, just because somebody's quoting the Bible and memorizing the Bible don't mean they know anything. I've heard people quote the Bible so far out of context, it was pathetic. In fact, some preachers, I can't figure out where they come from because they say this text is saying that. I said, just read two verses down before after what you said. It contradicts what you just said. But when you're not reading the Bible, you can say anything. But thank God, remember, 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 remember those that spoke unto you the word of God. 45 years, Pastor Otha Aiden, with his dear wife Sylvia, has been delivering to you the word of God. That is something worth celebrating. The Bible says back in uh, Hebrews, Remember, 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 don't forget, don't forget, remember those, remember those, those individuals, those people, that nothingness, that is somethingness, the man of God, who ruled over you, who spoke to you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering 
the outcome of their conduct. Now, whose faith followed. You see, the man of God is a role model for God of the consequences and results of a man or woman who lives by faith. Though, as Oath has already got back, you know, acknowledge the Lord in all thy ways. How are you going to acknowledge him in all your ways if you don't know his word? Acknowledging God means more than that. Hey, Lord, you guide me today. Now, I'll tell you, I, I've heard some of the craziest things from people. The Lord must have brought him along. He wasn't saved. He was living in immorality, uh -oh, but the Lord, it just worked out. We just met. No, you need to know the word of God. See, you got three enemies. One is the, 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 the devil, which we blame him for everything. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. No, half, no, probably 90% of the things the devil makes you do, you do them because you wanted to. Yeah. And the devil only encouraged you to do what you wanted to do. But the devil is a real foe, and he's a liar, and he's a deceiver, and he uses fear against There's the world that allures us. Oh, the world can make things so shiny and so glorious. Fool's gold. Once you get it, there's nothing in it. But you know, the greatest enemy we got 24-7 is our own flesh. And those of us who want to live by desire, and we believe, oh, oh, I wouldn't have this desire if God didn't give it to me. You need to critique those desires through the word of God. You need to talk to the man of God and the woman of God who've been through trials and been tested and been tempted and learned to say no. Rather obey God. Amen. Consider the end of it. Look, look, 45 years, folks, still married. 48 years, and he said to the same woman, that's important because you could have had about 15 in 48 years. Still married, teaching the word of God, believing the word of God, not running around complaining, oh me, oh my. Often when Oprah talks, he talks about, well, there ain't a big crowd out there at Southern Heights. But Jesus is out there, and that's what counts. Kind of because there's a man of God who's been faithful to the call of God upon his life to come into the urban area, to set up church in the urban area, to learn, to teach, to reach out to other pastors and minister to them in the urban area, to be concerned about young people in the urban area. He's there because God has called, his faith has kept him. Yeah. I often tell people, if you're secure in the Lord, you ain't worried about anybody else. When you got all this insecurity, I ain't big enough, I ain't good enough, I'm not this, I'm not that. I mean, come on, get a life. You living your life for other people. The big question is, is Jesus pleased? Amen. And if Jesus is pleased, I'm happy, thank you. Yes. Consider the end, consider the end, consider the end. There's a man that's come through racial times in our country and he's not bitter, he's not angry. He probably don't even remember this. He was talking to me one day and he said, I, I, I'm supposed to meet with this, this lady and uh, she's a white lady. I don't know, where I grew up, I ain't feeling comfortable sitting in some restaurant with some white lady. Well, I married one, so I'm comfortable. But, but, but it talks about the times and coming from the South. Yeah. He's been through some things. Yeah. He, he, could give, he, he could probably give you some stories that, 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 that but most people say, man, I can understand why you're an angry old black man. Yeah. But he's not. The grace of God. Consider the end of his faith. He talked about how Jesus forgave him and, and how Jesus has worked in his life and how Jesus keeps him and he looks at Jesus. And 
That's another thing that you need to consider is faith. He doesn't look to the White House or the courthouse or the schoolhouse. He looks to God for his provision. I had so many people talking about the man. I'm like, what man? The man's keeping me down. The man. I don't know what you're talking about, bro. What I see is you won't go to work. You won't go to school. I know about injustice and all this, but I want to tell you something. God is bigger than the man. And what God wants for me, there ain't no man or woman going to keep it from me. So I work on pleasing him and forget the man. Let some invisible thing keep you down. Consider his faith, the outcome of his conduct. He walks with God. 45 years here in this church. Now, he models not only his rule over you, his message to you, and his faith before you, but model in their care for you. Seeking to grow divine dividends on a priceless investment. Drop down to verse 17, Hebrews 13. Verse 17 says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch for your watch out for your souls as they that must give account. It is great to have models of people who care for you more than they do themselves. It is unusual, it is priceless to have a man for 45 years who can look out over his people and don't care whether you're rich, don't care whether you're poor, don't care whether you're educated, uneducated, whether you're, whether you're red, yellow, black, or white, but a man who finds value in you because you were created in the image of God, you've been redeemed by the blood of Christ, you are his property, and he has a responsibility to watch out for you. That's rare. And for 45 years, to have a man who would put value on people because God has valued them. To have a man who sees more than, than crime and, and more than, 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 than broken neighborhood, but a man who has hope that no, 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 in the midst of this, this turmoil, in the midst of this mess, God has saved the people and I'm going to watch out for their souls as they traffic in this world with all of its temptations. Watch out. Obey those who have to rule over you and be submissive for they watch for your souls as those that must give an account and, and living not for, for your pleasure, not for uh, the community's pleasure, but all of living for the pleasure of God. Caring for those broken lives and broken marriages and broken families and broken communities. This text says, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. One of the reasons we should remember the man of God is because he is God's instrument of the grace of God to conform us to the image of the Son of God for the glory and advancement of the kingdom of God. And, and I don't... We're going to go ahead on and work this baby to close because we got several other points we can go into here. But I wanted to say this to you. It says, let them do so with joy and not with grief. I had a young lady. Her father was a pastor. She came to me once and she said, what is the greatest disappointment in ministry? I said, people. She said, what is the greatest joy in ministry? I said, people. 
Jesus didn't die for buildings. He died for people. The minister's main focus is people. And when people fall in love with Jesus and obey Jesus, John says, I have no greater joy than that my children walk according to truth. Paul says, what is our, what is our rejoicing? A hope before the Lord are not even you. When God has saved a man and gifted a man and called a man and burdened a man for people, people who are disobedient, people who are non-submissive, it breaks your heart. Jesus wept over Jerusalem not the buildings, but the people. How oft, how oft I would have gathered you as a, as a hen gathers her chick, but you would not. Jeremiah, Lamentation, the weeping prophet over the people's rebellion from the word of God, forsaking the God of the word. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. How do you bring joy? Seeking the God whom your pastor loves. Kidding into his word. Delighting, obedient, believing him, trusting him. Following counsel that guides you to God. God. 